So one thing, one thing that you guys have probably observed with every speaker is um, the, the, the diversity of their talent. They, they're not happy just practicing maybe what you would typically prescribe as their professional focus. Um, true of everybody that's been up here today, um, um, their hobbies aren't really hobbies, they're just an extension of what they love to do and it all kind of ties back together. It's that, 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 there should be a theme to the summit this year that really, um, I'll, okay, I'll use a bad pun, that knits all those things together. So anyway, um, so you heard um, a little bit about Francois earlier. Uh, Fra Francois Robert started out as a designer in his homeland of Switzerland uh, many years ago and wandered his way and over to the U.S. via design, um, started um, at a company called Unimark in the U.S., which was um, uh, the, one of the predominant design firms globally, and, um, and he never went home. <laughs> And his first job when he got to the U.S., and I, correct me if I'm wrong, Francois, was to do a logo, one of his first jobs, for Great America, which is a theme park in uh, the Midwest, the Six Flags theme park. So imagine this Swiss guy landing in the U.S., and he has to create this logo for Great America, and he did a masterful job. Um, from there, he um, helped found a firm called Boulder Coats Robert, um, which was a, a tour de force in design in Chicago. Um, shortly thereafter, or during that tenure, Francois was um, maybe beginning to shoot more than he designed. He was photographing um, and designing, and, um, and then decided he might focus a little bit more on photography, but what's um, amazing, and maybe it's your Swiss blood, you, you treat the medium of photography um, through, through the eyes of, of, of a designer. So whether it's constructing or composing or thinking about um, the story a photo tells, you can, you can see that um, there, there is no sort of missing link there. Um, many of you in the audience have seen his work, um, whether it be personal or professional. We are really, really um, fortunate, um, as we have been the last two days, to welcome yet another world-class talent to the stage of the Creative Summit. I give you my dear, dear friend, Francois Robert. to see me or is it a microphone in your pocket? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad I came to the Great Eve the Summit. I thought I was will end up in some mountain regions and it's really freaking flat here. So <laughs> why do you call the summit? I really don't know. And, and I'm so glad I came because I've never seen a crochet striptease before. <laughs> It's really a nice event. It's too bad he had a skirt underneath. <laughs> it would be for the next year. It, it's actually vodka inside here, so don't worry about it. I just want to make a quick little note. Uh, Michael Cronin, wherever you are, save us a seat and hopefully hell is not too warm. <laughs> I want also to thank uh, the Great Summit, and without Chris Hill and Heidi, I wouldn't be here, and all the other great helper, my amazing wife, great designer Jane Giddings, and my mother, gynecologist. <laughs> 
I will not get into it. You can save the question for the Q&A. <laughs> uh, and if you're the first one to ask the question, you will get rewarded with a present. So it might be interesting. <laughs> So Dana was right, I started a company called Bowler Coats and Shoes. It's a play on word. Uh, and I always start uh, a conference with a little bit of humor. So because I think design without humor is no design. And this guy walks in his home during lunchtime to surprise his wife. And he heard a lot of noise in a bedroom, so he gets there and he sees his wife making love passionately with another guy. And he said, what are you doing? And the wife looked at the lover and she said, I told you it was stupid. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, but... <laughs> Oh my God, it's my name there. And before I started, it was something, before I started, Michael Doran, which is uh, this great uh, calligrapher designer, said, would you stop calling yourself Francois Robert and just go by Francois Robert? So we're gonna make a vote here very quickly. Who wants to be, who wants to call me Frankie Bobby? <laughs> or Francois Robert? So, Frankie Bobby, raise your hand. Come on, guys. And who won the Francois Robert? Oh, shit, you're right, Michael. <laughs> I have to correct that, boy, 30 years I milked that accent. Uh, so, we're going to start from the beginning, I suppose. Hi. And. And so many of you here today, the great speaker, have already covered all my subject matter, so... <clears throat> and uh, one of the things that I was surprised that then I brought Metroset. But when you look at this graffiti, you really wonder why the people have to go back to school. <laughs> So I started pressing type, yes. I left Switzerland to move in Italy to work for Pirelli for three years. And it was just the most amazing experience. <clears throat> Leaving your hometown, they were just so happy to do so. Uh, and uh, this is my first samples, printed. It, it really means uh, as soon as a year is over, another one starts. It was a little greeting card for the company I was working for. I, I did an apprenticeship in connections with a, a, a graphic art school. And, uh, and very quickly I moved to Milan, I got a job, and was starting to lay that brochure. You know, I'm, I'm 23 and incidentally I have the responsibility. <clears throat> I think I need more vodka. Boy, it's dry in Texas. Michael, you want some? No? That's really good. And, uh, <clears throat> and I need the front and the back of that brochure. I got involved designing a billboard, and this is a poster that I designed. It's a Cinturato Pirelli. It's very secure, secure on wet road, and designed the type, the typeface. And, and just things were really rolling great, and, and, and I was bombarded with great American culture as well. So this is all designed by hand, basically, because I'm an old part here, just uh, we didn't have any uh, Photoshop or computer at the time. And, uh, and I finally jumped the ocean, as uh, Dana described, from illegally and we'll talk about undocumented immigrant later. Uh, who's laughing back there? <laughs> the border patrol, the funny five <clears throat> Trust me, they are resting a long time ago. Somebody who was 41, year, 41 years in the United States, undocumented, 
because he blew a red light and he was sent back home. So after 41 years, you never know. <clears throat> and uh, I was hired by Playboy to do many projects, and one was to design a new magazine in uh, in 72, so 73. <clears throat> so there's some applications, and uh, I've done some other logo. And, and one of the reasons I gave up the partnership uh, in Chicago, because being been having partner, it's like being married without sex. <laughs> it's not fun. This, this is, before I came to the U.S., I made a quick stop in uh, Johannesburg for Unimark. I didn't have a seat for me here, and they said, well, why you don't start there and start to practice your English? So I did. You can tell how much I've improved. <laughs> So this is some of the application of the logo. And uh, one of the projects I have to do for Playboy is, as a photographer is to do a book on called The Twelfth Night of Christmas. Uh, and uh, I designed the book, photograph, and they were just like, oh wow, this is a, this is a wonderful exercise. I love Playboy. <laughs> And I was asked to do some more books. One was on Helmut Newton, and combined my own typography with the photo of a great photographer. And one of the projects at Unimark is to redesign uh, some some tissue box. Uh, and and, uh, and I was really excited because I've never designed really some packaging. And, and also one of the early work, I was working like a machine basically. You wonder, this is already 72, and this is the cover for an annual report I designed, uh, the Purify Water. And it's what then I described as Great America. And eventually you connect with Fuse Swiss. And, and one of the Swiss it was a printer, and he said, my friend runs the new Glarus Hotel. Why you don't design the menu? So I did. And, and typography is still my passion even today. And it's something that you cannot just let it go. And it's really, it's really fascinating for me, uh, typography. And there's so many great typographers including Rick Balasanti and many other, and, and also Michaels and Dana. So it's it really my passion. So one of my first contests back in Europe is to design a letter set, a typeface made out of circle. So you milk it and decide it with stars. Hey, if somebody can put crochet on a ball and cover this, why not doing something else that's very similar to uh, without going crazy? <laughs> <coughs> and, and the last one I did, uh, it was part of the Stop the Violence series because when I decided to go and do this, this project and somehow some people lost a lot of work during the balloon in 07 when everything crashed, but I decided, well, nobody's going to call me, so I better find myself doing something that's worth it. And, and I decided to lay in my body on my, uh, on my knee and, and decide to design a typeface made out of human bone. <laughs> and you have seen the video, and then Rick and I worked together. So I went, <clears throat> my transition in, in full-time photography is because I really am passionate about photography. Um, I see it, my life is a visual voyage and, and, and I'm so blessed also Jane loves to travel. We travel the world. Before I met Jane, I used to travel on other people's budget from uh, Tierra del Fuego, uh, to the North Sea documenting offshore platform, to uh, the, the, the East. So it was just really an amazing journey. So 
left the uh, ball at Saint Robert and started to reconnect a whole bunch of people in the same industry, designers. I, I'm not big on ad agency. I'm not like Sandra Miller. Uh, he's doing really well with ad agency because he likes having a whole team behind him and he's good about it. I like to keep it so simple. I don't have dogs. I don't have kids and plants. I just, <laughs> I just step out of the house and hope for the best. <laughs> And few of the project, this, this is somebody who shaved his head on uh, USSR symbols. Uh, it was drug abuse in the USSR, the article. And got a few commissions, got photographies, asked me to do some covers. I've been featured twice in graphics, in an article, and some other great venture with higher agency and once in a while I do my own little project. This is my waffle head and somebody saw it and they said, well, you, I think you can do it with glass and martini. And uh, one of the big surprise after doing a report across the world for corporate America, uh, suddenly Crate and Barrel got interested in what I was doing completely indirectly. Another great lucky day. <clears throat> My stylist is working with me and she's friends with a woman who's in charge of the catalog. So Great and Barrel become bigger than life for me. <clears throat> Spent 11 years uh, shooting their catalog and ads. It actually paid a lot of my lifestyle, but it's why I don't own any mortgage. And, and also the fact that working with with great stylists. I mean, the definition of a photographer, uh, uh, the definition of a stylist, a makeup artist, is somebody who makes a photographer look good. And you can interrupt me because there's no subtitle today, so if you don't understand what I'm talking about, please do so. And, and, and just out of nowhere, when I finally quit uh, in 03, I got a phone call in Chicago and, and somebody said, well, we do want to do work with a company called Unison Home. And uh, I said, why not? I mean, I've, I've got a break. I've worked with this wonderful client called Bentley Prince, Prince Street and Floor, uh, two carpet company. And, and I said, well, maybe uh, I might continue to do in that same field. And, uh, I find out that the guy who had started the company after I say yes is the son of the man who had started creating barrels. So it was just like, oh my God, I'm going to aim for the third generation if I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> so this, they do wonderful uh, tablecloths, bed sheets, uh, comforter. Uh, and it's just really great. And also I work a lot with Jane, my wife, in this project. We travel together. Uh, Jane tell me if it's in focus, out of focus. Uh, <laughs> did it really help? But, no, but basically we work as a team and, it's, and we, we work together on a lot of the compositions. Uh, so it's almost the feedback back and forth. My motto is to I specialize in, in, in everything, basically. Uh, I don't want to be pigeonholed. You might, you might, decide, you might dis discover, find a style after five years. There will be people going after you style and, and charging a tenth of what you, you charge now. So in the internet, it's so difficult to keep. So it just brought up your entire, your entire skill. <coughs> This is some early work on pottery transfer. It was commissioned to do for uh, an aid uh, fundraise. I got assigned by Rolling Stone to do some product photography with the same media.
And quickly, this three image from the Chicago Board of Trade. It was just a pleasure to work with uh, Dana and, and some other of his partner. Uh, I think I work with practically every partner at BSA. And, uh, and it just, was just really great because there was a sense of team effort. Just And it, it's just crazy when they opened the door of the Board of Trade. Uh, I thought I was in the old Roman time where everybody's screaming. When you look at the people in the center, this guy's going to be screaming for about five hours just completely against the other person's body. Two four and a lollipop. And yes, uh, keep following Dana somehow, because uh, there's always good work at VSA. And I say, what the fuck is that? <laughs> he really loved the founder of Harley Davidson. I mean, I would put Angela to a leaf, for God's sake, <laughs> on a motorcycle. So there's, there's a lot more image. I mean, I'm not sure how many photo assignments I've done in my life, but I'm, I'm just, for this lecture, I'm going to just combine to very few. So not too far away from my home uh, in, in the Midwest, when I'm in the Midwest, in the, in the winter, I go and hide in uh, uh, Tucson, Arizona, and there's this big contest. It's called Mr. and Miss Nude America, right at my doorstep, basically. So. Uh, and this is the male winners. <laughs> and, and this is what photographer have really of a bad name. And, and somehow I'm, I'm on every photo, remember, at least my shoes. And uh, a great assignment, it's, it's up going to be Jane on the left in the background and my uh, uh, portrait on the right, but this is for Bentley Prince Street, it's another great company. Most of those people I work with, I call them dream kind. So you, when you look at all this, you wonder, I mean, what, I'm glad he doesn't specialize. And I'm glad too. This is for a campaign called Rough and Smooth. Well, it was a brochure for the same carpet company. It's, this is another campaign. Now, we have a cat, and, and I decided, why not throwing the cat into the set? <laughs> it was only worked once, and I'm glad I got on one frame. He was so pissed off. <laughs> I think there was a knock on the following day about animal cruelty. Uh, the theme of this campaign was Clockwork Orange, so, so you wonder why we threw our cats in the set. And I got all share phone calls. And say, would you would you go and photograph Eyeshaver Cell, this amazing uh, Turkish slash American industrial designer that works at the time with uh, Herman Miller, and another great guy from Pentagram, say Francois, my name is Woody Pertles. Uh, would you go and travel Arizona after a whole week with a writer and your assistant, all paid for? And I say, well, let me let me think about twice. Uh, let me count to two seconds and I will tell you, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go. So this is what I ended up in Tucson for some, some reason. Uh, Florida did not attract me to avoid the winter. I spent almost a year on and off with Crate and Barrel on the beaches. And, and Arizona became something that it needed to focus because my, uh, my old bones somehow couldn't take the Chicago anymore. So Jen and I, we move at the end of 99. And I like portrait, naturally.
this, with this woman who wanted to start a, a business uh, as a comedian. Uh, her father is my dentist in Chicago, so they say, well, are you going to fix my crown and I can photograph your daughter? <laughs> Would you say no? No, I mean, it's just, uh, I was hoping I can have a, a pizza maker and her daughter to be photographed. <laughs> This is a story for the Chicago Magazine on how to set up your wedding, where to go on your honeymoon, uh, who to select the flowers, and, and who set you plates and you silverware. And I was on, shoot, on a shoot in Florida for Quentin Brown, and I said, this guy bringing his boat his model board, and it really fascinated me because it, it says in the back, crew. <laughs> and I was uh, a lucky guy to be assigned uh, on the day in the life of America, the, the famous book where they sent 200 photographers on May 6, I think, in, in 86. Uh, and I was, I was assigned Las Vegas. So I really don't know how this guy ended up above the pool, but I, I thought he, they took me around the, the two and a half acre in the middle of, of, uh, of Las Vegas. And as a joke, when I look around, I said, well, just pick a spot, we'll levitate for you. And, and I was not quite sure I will get them to do so because when I approached their manager, he'd say, what do you want us to do? Yes, I'm working for the book, The Day in the Life of America. Uh, I would love to photograph Siegfried and Lloyd and, um, and, and what we're getting out of it. They said, well, you may have a chance to be in a book. May have a chance to be in a book. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of crazy photo editor out there, and you never know if they're going to select your picture. And, uh, but I said, you, you will be on the news at 6 o'clock. I have an NBC crew following me for three hours on these projects. It's okay. And we'll get back to you at 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm in a brothel just outside Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the, the madame tell me, you have a phone call. I say, oh my God. It's Herbie, all coked up. Well, you have been going at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I said, would you mind repeat it without all that coke up your nose and, and, and open your teeth? So I showed up at 3 o'clock. But what really fascinated me the most out of this assignment is when I went to see their, uh, their performance on stage, there was a woman who had seen the show 575 times. <laughs> And there's a big giant spotlight that comes on her and they say, this is all but well, see, I've seen the show 575 times. And I'm like, at the end of the show, I'm rushing to her and I say, is there any way I can photograph you? Because I'm a lot more interested than Siegfried and Roy. <laughs> I mean, it, it's the obvious Siegfried and Roy, but Opal Wells. And she said, that it's like bodyguard to run around me. And, and I said, well, I realized this woman was really part of the show. She was a fanatic about those two German guys, and, and they finally took her on board, which uh, it was a major surprise. So I ended up at her one studio apartment. And you can tell, I mean, it's just the dead flower from 12 years ago. I mean, it's just every... And the photo editor back in New York thought I set up the freaking shop with a stylist. I mean, it would have took me two years to set up this room. <laughs> it would be the two years in the day, the, the, the two years in the life of Opal Wells. And once in a while, I just like uh, five years ago or seven years ago, I was here and I asked in the audience, does anybody want to post noon for me? They just, I will fly you in in Tucson and uh, we'll pay you airfare and give you some money and show it up. Once in a while, I get models that come by the state and say, yeah, I would love to do that. <coughs> this is, it happened to be our apartment in Tucson.
uh, this this particular photo became the one and then asked me to reshoot uh, for the, the fundraise for another uh, aid event. It was only shot in black and white and we both agreed it would be nice to have it in color. If there's underage people here, I really apologize. <laughs> it's usually when I make wake up the the wide the male audience here, they finally give up on their iPhone. <laughs> now, just a, a small piece of advice: is you guys have seen so many advice today. <laughs> So I feel like just going to throw one quickly. If you put if you put ten thousand ping pong ball in a in a pool, make sure you get a real good team to pick them up at the end of the photo shoot. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 1976, I got a phone call from London. My brother is also a, a wonderful graphic designer in Zurich. He, he designed uh, Swatch Watch the five first year. Did an amazing job, and we have worked together on a few occasions, not a lot. We started to stay away from business between the two of us. We adore each other. And uh, he called me and he said, Well, I'm working for Pentagram. It's called the Pentagram Book, and uh, the theme is faces. So if you see an object with faces, please do me a favor, document it. This is, this is my bro, Jean Robert. And Lars Mueller in Switzerland published the first book called Face to Face in 91. We finally got, after the first one, the Pentagram paper came out in 77. We decided, oh, we might as well put our shit together. I keep saying it's all the time. So there was one of them, and we got into color. <coughs> Jane designed this version for Chronicles. It sold 25,000 copy. Now that you make a shitload of money with selling books, but just basically I went a wire, everybody wanted to do a calendar, wanted to use it for something, and, and we ended up doing children carpet tile for floor with it. And we did a version for a children books, it's called Find a Face. Jane designed it, come up with a copy, and this is few of you friendly face. At my influence with Dana in Jamaica, <laughs> Mr. Rastaman. <laughs> I really want this as a doctor. You know, they always ask you, are you in pain today? And what kind of pain are you in? <laughs> so another, another Great project that started in the 70s uh, with a small black and white camera. It was called Contents. I used to invite friends and I say, uh, Would you like to come for brunch? Would you like for dinner? Or would you like for uh, for uh, a midnight a midnight snack? And uh, I, I, when it come to my place, or especially the late version, I reopened. It was just like, Would you come for a very special portrait? So I would invite people in my, in my home studio uh, and I will ask them if they don't mind to empty the contents of their purse or pants or backpack. So I document 200 people. <coughs> this cop gave me his loaded guns. It's like, are you kidding me? It's loaded? <laughs> This little girl didn't have anything. I was showing this photo uh, to a woman. He said, what is this blue thing on top? And they said, are you kidding me? The, the title of this piece is, I'm going to see my boyfriend. <laughs> so postpone marriage, travel, please. I mean, just. Freaking wait. <laughs> there's way, there's way enough kids out there to begin with. 
and uh, you can do like you have been married at 86. <laughs> and, and if you cannot find a companion to go with you, take two. <laughs> Because the world will make you a completely different being. Uh, I mean, it is so amazing what you see, what you touch, what you smell, and and uh, pretty soon a lot of country will be so inaccessible. I mean, I've been in Yemen. Jen and I we've been in Kashmir. Kashmir is a war zone, ready to freaking explode. Uh, we're going to try to enter Iran. Uh, so. There's a lot of countries just shutting off. Uh, I've been a few times in Egypt and it's not easy to get there. You, you feel like a condola rice. You get escorted by a machine gun to go and visit museum and temple. So, and this is some of the image I picked, uh, picked on an assignment, traveling with Jane, traveling on my own. It's hard not to give money to a cute beggar like this in Bombay. But then China is soon to have opened their border to foreigners in 86. I was glad when I went back to the parking lot that my, my bicycle seat was about a foot higher than the average Chinese person. Because I would have never find it otherwise. <laughs> we were recently, Jen and I, in Calcutta, visiting Bhutan and, and Thailand. You can tell we just left just before or after the monsoon season. And, and, and I can notice a face way up there on the right. This when you have bad telephoto lens. There's some great museum in Paris. I'm always fascinated, as you can tell, by bones. A friend of mine called me finally, you are really a bone be bone. Jesus. I'm glad he only comes every seven years here. And this is like the magic of doctor in the 19th century. Don't look at your patients and let her get all dressed up. It really fascinated me. You're progressing nicely, darling. Uh, this is a photo of uh, the headquarters in Paris of the Communist Party designed by Niemeyer, who built Brasilia. This is my Hopper versions. And Jane documenting some wonderful little letter on some great mural in Paris. This is the door of an IG member in Paris as well. Lawrence Madrell, great designer. We, we're jumping really quickly from country to country. We're back in the white desert in Egypt. This woman was just selling her crap. It's really beautiful. We went home with, a, with seven of her long drawing painting. This is a, an amazing scene in the white desert. And we pick the driver and just go along the tour bus. We try to most of the time to avoid tour bus when we can. It's not always that easy. This is an amazing performance of typography on a building. Make sure you not only go for one day to visit the pyramids or any other great site because you forget there might be fogs. <laughs> a 
and man, it's fun to ride a train. This is uh, <coughs> on the way to uh, Capo Canyon in Mexico. The Capo Canyon is twice the size of the Grand Canyon. And you can laugh in the morning, having lots of fun. And you can be scared shitless going over the bridge. <laughs> Make sure you get a diaper. <laughs> and do a zip line. And it's all related to food and great smell from Bangkok to Mexico to uh, China. I mean, it's just really amazing. I'm not sure if I would, I would trust the dentist, but I might go home with his door. <laughs> and the reason we went this year to see the, the Copper Canyon, uh, was it last year, Jim? Last year? A year ago. Jesus. <coughs> Can't fly. Uh, it's because there's a, a wonderful group, uh, Indian group called the Taramara, or Rara Mulis. Uh, they, are, they are famous for to be those, those super long distance runner. And they're famous from a book called Born to Run. So please read it because it's just a great lesson about how to really run and I don't take advantage of other people. And they dance for 48 days on the sound of drum. There's a bum 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 and just like, oh my god, and you get into it after two hours. You shoot me and you go bum 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 and they come from all over the country, I mean, all over the regions. I mean, they make, they make like 100 miles by foot. I mean, they just, they just really, and they, they only run with the, the more simple sandals. Just, it's, a, it's an old tire with, with, with uh, lace made out of uh, skin. And they're so beautiful in color. And you get all the tattoo, and yes, they, they eat ice cream, which happen to be colorful. And they walk more, they go to different places, you um, bum, 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 and you sleep all night, and you hear bum, 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 bum. They even make you sign a waiver, then you will not sue them because you couldn't sleep that night. <laughs> and this is how the sandal looks like. And it would run 100 miles on those sandals. They completely revolutionized Nike on that, on that concept. That's why you see a lot of people running barefoot now. And you know what they say about big shoes. <laughs> big socks. Now, if there's a lightning, I wouldn't want to stand next to this guy. <laughs> and uh, when I was in Italy just recently, it happened, the Pope asked me to ask you a question, and he said, why you and Jen are always so happy? And he said, we keep traveling. We see the world, not with a Pope mobile. And he said, you know what, I'm going to quit. <laughs> And this is why I spent seven months of my life on my knee, and that's where Jane spent a month of retouching the pile. And I think you have seen this image by now. You've been fighting over the books, so and my apology, I couldn't bring any more. And the reason I create the alphabet, because I want to make word out of it. Uh, a, a little note here very quickly, and I'm not sure if I'm just blowing all the Q&A. Uh, you should always remember, I mean, this is very important for you guys, about the subject of the violence. Six, six is, bless you. Uh, 
66 million died in World War II. It's about 150 times the size of San Marco. Just completely wiped out. Uh, during the Vietnam War, the country lost about 2 million people, which 60% were civilian. And 58,000 US, 58, US soldiers. And, and my personal feeling uh, is the Middle East war will never stop. Because for very, a very simple reason, it's Israel will never return the occupied land because there's already a half a million people on it. So whoever prime minister will get a job to evacuate a half over by now over half a million people, it is no way he's going to find the vote and the support. So the Middle East will be a crisis for a long time. So it's really sad. And, and in another, another lecture I learned that uh, one out of three women in the army gets raped or sexually abused. And, and it, it occurred to me that it's a, why would they join the army if they have such a bad reputation? And the person was giving me the lecture say what they need to feed their family. So vote, control you, you modify food, control, we don't want to go in Iran, we don't want to go in Korea. There's already 28,000 soldiers in South Korea. So I, mean, it just, I think we should think about stopping to be the world police, in, in my own mind. So Jen and I, two years ago, we decided to join just give back a little bit to the society. We live in Tucson. Tucson have a huge bad rap about how we treat foreigners, gun control. It happened when I had my opening at Terry Epperton Gallery. Uh, the day they opened <coughs> the show, uh, Gabby Gifford get shot. So really, really, uh, it's like, what, what can we do to help our community? Here, and I decided to join with Jane, the, the Samaritan. There's three organizations in Tucson that drop water and food in a desert. I mean, about 200 people died every year trying to become a U.S. citizen or try to find work. And it's called the American Dream. Uh, not then hours came undocumented. In the United States, I had a tourist visa which I extended and I could have been arrested today and sent it right back to Switzerland uh, and had to wait seven years to come back. So they want to come in the U.S., but they're going to die in the desert because there's plenty of yo-yo on, on the Mexican side telling them why Tucson or oh, Phoenix is about a day walk. Uh, Tucson from the border actually, and the open border is about a uh, four-day walk if you're lucky. You cannot, you cannot bring enough water with you to survive. So we go and, and we draw water. We, we just put load all that body with food and water and on the way back from the desert we pick all the trash. Because they bring a lot, I mean, uh, and so we pick everything back. There's a lot of students who do this, there's a lot of uh, organizations, so we try to do a little contribution in a border. And what I was fascinated is all the objects they left behind, all those men, men tools, man-made tools, and they, they're really beautiful on their own. And too many people have recorded on the ground, which I did, and it looks like a giant trash pile. And, and I said, well, I'm going to ask people if they have their own collection, and I started my own, and, and I thought all those objects on their own were so beautiful. You, know, you wonder why they're covered in blue jeans, painted black. It's because they don't reflect from helicopter rides. And, and every, every, every story is moving for me. Uh, we also drop food and water on the other side of the border to shelters. And when you look at those people, they have the, the most wonderful face. Uh, bed wrap with being always drug related, uh, gang, and, and actually 
I would say 98% of those people are just regular human beings like you and you and me. This is what a book looks like after you're in a desert. You find letter they carry. I mean, you wonder why you find all this, and, and it's basically when helicopters circle the area of 15 uh, undocumented immigrants, they create so much dust and they really wanted to just run away. So they drop everything they have with them and hopefully they're not going to hit a cactus and just be completely wounded. And we have seen a lot of wounded people. If you find those kind of shoes, they don't leave just prints of their shoes. The bottom I have given up. So they have to wrap with something else. I mean, you see, you see uh, people with blister, they're just amazing. I mean, the, the desert reached probably 140 degree temperature. In the winter, they come down to 17 degrees. And, and a lot of them, they not come from the border. They, they have never seen snow. They have never seen a super cold night. So they, we, they, they find even eight body from Nepal. I mean, the people enter in a corridor in the southern desert, from Nepal. And you find a uh, carnet to learn English. And when you find bones, which I did, uh, you have to call the sheriff. You walk with your Samaritan leader. He has a GPS, and they collect everything that's, that's, that's of human uh, of humans uh, parts because they have a morgue where they identify. They do DNA. I mean, it just it's a crazy uh, environment in Tucson, especially also. All the all the uh, illegal we call it undocumented immigrant arrive and they get catch something like 150 every day. And we back to contents. This this woman just had to really run and just didn't even care about her bag and maybe got arrested as well. So we, we don't know. I mean, there's a lot of those image objects. We don't know who they belong to, except we can track them down with a photo. And yes, they carry baby with them. So the chance of a baby to survive is really severe. This is an unusual uh, promise. This, this gentleman promised for two years he will not drink alcohol or, or smoke dope uh, if he, if he, if he uh, survived the, the trip. And you find a lot of those blankets also covered with, uh, with religious figures. So thank you so much for your attention.